who knows what Abraham Lincoln sounded like? I, you know, it's a very interesting choice that that Daniel Day Lewis makes. So interesting where to pitch his voice. Um, no one knew, of course, what Lincoln sounded like, but but he makes these interesting choices based on, I guess, the stuff that he researches and reads, and and I guess it it, it lent itself to the the image that we have that Abraham Lincoln was this absolutely powering but um, extremely fair and gentle human being. Hello and welcome to the Aspects of History podcast. My name is Oliver Webb Carter and I'm the editor and your host. Now today is the first of my Aspects of History Film Club episodes. And my decision to start this series of bonus episodes on a monthly basis may well be a bad idea. In fact... It's the worst plan since Abraham Lincoln said, Oh, I'm sick of kicking around the house tonight. Let's go take in a show. <laughs> yes, the film is Lincoln, directed by Steven Spielberg and starring Daniel Day-Lewis. I'm going to be running these episodes with friend of the show, director Tim Hewitt. So listeners, I do hope you can enjoy it. If you do or don't, you can let me know either through the Twitter or you can email me. Links are in the show notes. Next coming up is Argo, which will be released in March as a bonus. Both Tim and I think Lincoln is a great film, but it's not without its problems, so we discuss those. We also include three categories, most unlikely scene, greatest performance and legacy. This discussion on Lincoln, whilst it probably has spoilers, I think it's safe to assume that most people know the Union won the Civil War against the Confederacy. And the film has been out for more than 10 years, so I'd say you can listen to this whether or not you've watched it. Coming up on the pod, I've got Ian Mortimer on the Middle Ages, John Sayles talking 18th century America and filmmaking, and Anthony Selden on, on walking the Western Front of World War I. I've also got James Rom discussing the aftermath of the death of Alexander the Great, the Wars of the Diadochi, they're called. Now, this may not be known to some of you, but it's such a fascinating period of ancient history. I really do hope you can join me for that. Please do subscribe to get these upcoming shows and rate and review if you can. But in the meantime, I'll hand you over to me and Tim Hewitt discussing Lincoln. Tim Hewitt, welcome back to the podcast. But this is a new a new feature that I've introduced. It's the Aspects of History Film Club. And so in association with the director, Tim Hewitt, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having um, me back. Well, we, we had a good time talking about our top 10. So listeners, yeah. If, yeah and listeners, if you didn't catch that, you can go back and uh, uh, Tim's competes against my te top 10 mm. and his do tend to come off a little bit better with <laughs> technical know-how so Tim had proposed two films for us to kick off the, the film club with and the first of which is Lincoln made mm -hmm. in 20 or released in 2012 directed by the great Steven Spielberg starring Daniel Day-Lewis and Sally Field and a host of other uh, great actors tim you proposed this mm. and we're going to do another one as well uh, which will yeah. be coming out next month as a bonus podcast dear listeners which will be argo directed by ben affleck but we were just saying as we mm. hit record that these were both released in the same year and i wondered if that was why you picked them tim well actually yes because i mean they really are very different obviously and completely different periods. But it, again, like we were talking about in our last podcast, when films like this compete at award ceremonies, uh, how on earth do you decide which one's better, essentially better, what is best film? Uh, Argo won that year, I think deservedly so. But I do think that Lincoln, Lincoln's a very interesting story, I think, the one that that Steven Spielberg is telling because uh, originally I believe it was Liam Neeson was cast as Lincoln and it was originally going to be a lot more of his life the, his lifespan uh, and as things went along it was I, I believe Spielberg's first 
reading of the script that was sent to him was something like 500 pages long. And, you know, it was just too much for a film. So they cut it down to his struggle to uh, pass the anti-slavery amendment. And I think that's when Liam Neeson dropped out, actually. Um, Did he drop it, out because it was about uh, the change of the script, or he just? Yeah, I think he wanted to do. What do they more call it? His life, not scheduling clash. They probably did, to be honest, because of the delays, and they probably said, "Well, now he's not not available." But I don't, I don't know really the ins and outs of it. But then, and I, then I think Daniel Day Lewis had turned it down as he usually does. I think he turned was it down this pretty in amateur. one of his? Is, is this in hmm. one of his retirement phases? Uh, wasn't his whole career in one of his retirement phases i think he has retired for good now but who knows yeah so i think and so that they whittled it down to concentrate on just this period um which i think is better because biopics can you know tend to follow the same formula particularly historical biopics they there's always the rise and fall there's always the same beats in the story that you kind of get um uh with with pretty much anyone's life story so I thought this was much more interesting. I don't think it's without its flaws, uh, but I think it is fa- is a fantastic piece of filmmaking. And he's a very interesting character, uh, I think. Um, he certainly know. is. He is a, he, mm. Abraham Lincoln is a fascinating character. And yeah. I think this book was based on a, a, a history book called The Team of Rivals. It's, yes. It's a long one. It's about, it's a, nearly a thousand pages. So I can see why the script was originally quite yeah. a long one. But um, um, it's. And yeah, I think the, she was on, she was on the, the author. Doris Kearns Goodwin. Yes, was on hand quite a bit. And I think Spielberg got the, got the, the rights, the film rights to it very early. You know, I just think, and I think the book, the book is a lot long. It's, it covers a lot more, obviously, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, but, you know, it was such a pivotal period of his presidency that I think it was, you know, the right thing to do to concentrate on something that's so prevalent and so timeless. And Because Lincoln is known as, of course, the president who was assassinated, mm. Civil War, slavery, yeah. and the 13th yeah. Amendment really does get to the, the heart mm. of it. Absolutely. And oh, what an array of characters in the film. And really fascinating and how they went about trying to get the votes. You know, something I didn't know about, really, the detail. And well, I think it's a really good picture uh, 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 showing of of um, the sort of horse trading and mm. <laughs> the machinations yeah. that go on behind the scenes, which I'm sure yeah. happen in most, if not all democracies. Uh, you know, there's that famous saying is that you, it's a, it's um, lawmaking is like sausage making. You just don't want to see yeah. Yeah. what happens. What goes into them. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, it's it's a gr- it's an amazing recreation of the period as well. Who knows what Abraham Lincoln sounded like? I, You know, it's a very interesting choice that that Daniel Day-Lewis makes as his all his choices, I think, are. I'll, I'll, I will preface that, in fact, with that was it was a very good year, I think, that that year for film. Um, I think Argo was was a was an amazing piece of filmmaking. I find it a little odd that Ben Affleck wasn't nominated for Best Director. However, my theory is that his name was on the table and someone nudged it with their elbow and it fell in the bin accidentally and no one realized. It was alphabetical. Now, yeah, maybe. But I mean, it went, Argo won Best Picture, but it didn't even get nominated for Best Director. And I think that's one of its strengths. But Lincoln, you know, was, was I think, was a great, great piece of storytelling. However, I may be one of the few people who disagree with the fact that Daniel Day Lewis won Best Actor, because there was one other performance that year that I thought was tremendous and should have won. Um, and that was Joaquin Phoenix in a film called The Master. And I think Daniel Dielos is fantastic. And I always and I think he deservedly has won two out of his three Oscars. But his choices of uh, uh, so interesting of where to pitch his voice. Um, no one knew, of course, what Lincoln sounded like. But but he makes these interesting choices based on, I guess, the stuff that he researches and reads. And and I guess it it, it lent itself to the the image that we have that Abraham Lincoln was this absolutely powering but 
um, extremely fair and gentle human being. Well, um, he, I, you mentioned that we don't know what his voice sound like. I mean, there mm. aren't. You're right. There aren't any recordings. But I think that the slight high pitched nature of it is is mentioned in historical record and then also yeah. his gait the way he walked like like yeah. a sort of lanky sort of dinosaur absolutely which i think de lewis ca captures quite br brilliantly the way he holds his arms the way he even takes that very iconic hat off and on and i think he he, he had something done to his ears to make them stick out a little bit more like abraham lincoln because I'm pretty sure that Daniel Day-Lewis doesn't have ears like he does in Lincoln. So, you know. It wouldn't he... surprise me. There is nothing <laughs> that Day-Lewis won't do. No. I mean, he, he insisted on the entire cast and crew calling him Mr. President. Isn't that just... You know, on and off. <laughs> Isn't that boring? Oh, he's like, I, I don't know. I, yeah. It depends how stuff, far though. you... you... I, I, I've seen him. I've seen in interviews with him where he's like, you know, I can't... If I, I'm not convinced then I just feel like I won't be able to convince anyone else. So if he just doesn't feel comfortable and it doesn't, it's not working for him, then I guess you can argue, yeah, okay. But at the same time, you know, it is all make-believe that this, you know, this it's not documentary stuff and it's it's not, uh, so I don't know, it's, it's kind of like a little, you can see, I can see it both ways, but sometimes it feels like it gets a little bit excessive. He does take um, yeah, life a little bit too seriously. Yeah. I think. Um, but you know, look what he's look what he's done. It's been he's given us great performances. Uh, yeah, the boxer. I think uh, I love him in mm -hmm. the boxer. Uh, I got ignored by um, the Oscars, and we're about to have a speaking around about the time when the Oscars are about to be announced, or, or we've had the nominations. I don't know when they're due out. Yeah, the uh, I think it's March, March sometime. Yeah. So we should. Ju I just want to briefly mention the Oscars, mm. and then we'll kick off with the film. And um, sure. I think the the uh, are the Oscars now almost entirely devalued. They I don't, don't get, know. They don't get the ratings. And no. It's look at the difficult. nominations. It's getting the list is getting longer and longer each year. Mm. They nominated Maverick, the Tom Cruise film, which yes. I don't think the first um, uh, Top Gun film would have been nominated. Um, no, I think that would have been a real stretch in those days. I mean, I think it's been nominated for film and screenplay, which is very interesting. But then again, why? Why not? Why you know all that they. They don't tend to nominate the big blockbusters for things like screenplay and sometimes picture, yes, but but the <laughs> it's I mean it's very subjective, but I really liked the Maverick, to be honest. I didn't expect it to get nominated for a best screenplay Oscar, but or even an Oscar, to be honest. But I, you know, it's difficult. They they've always said what determines someone worthy of being nominated for an Oscar, does it have to be a serious role does it have to be a serious film why can't slapstick comedy ever get nominated for oscars so i don't know it's it's a strange role i don't i don't find them as attract the oscars these days as attractive as i did when i was much younger like in the 90s when billy crystal and Whoopi goldberg were presenting presenting them and and in our country you know barry norman was always uh, introducing them and stuff i always felt it was a little bit more glitzy and attractive and I don't know, it's become a little... I don't stay up, let's say, nowadays, all no, night to watch no. them anymore. No. Now, um, I'm going to do a shameless name drop here, but the listeners will be in it because this will be a podcast coming out. I think it's going to come out on the in the first Saturday in March. I was interviewing an Oscar-nominated director and writer, oh, wow. John Sayles. Oh, fantastic. John Sayles. Yeah, great. Dude, I, yeah, I love his films and he's a wonderful, lovely man. And he's just written a historical novel. So there's the only relevance to this conversation is that he's a filmmaker and he's been Oscar mm -hmm. nominated. But I, I thought I would do that shamelessly to impress director Tim. Well, he, he, he made one of the great sort of indie Western, modern Westerns, a film called Lone Star, which with Ma Matthew McConaughey and... Chris Christopherson, Chris Christopherson, and Chris Cooper, and Chris Cooper, yeah, and and it's in two timeline, two periods. Uh, I think is it the fifties and the present day in Texas, and it is. I mean, if anyone's listening who hasn't seen it, it is a great film. Matthew McConaughey in a very early role and a very serious role for his rom com spree. Great film. 
Well, it's great that you you interviewed him. That's fantastic. lovely man, lovely man. Wow. Um, so there's a little trail for the listeners there, right? So the film itself, so it opens mm-hmm. with, uh, I think we're just seeing the conclusion of a battle, and and Lincoln is yeah, Lincoln is is sitting under a canopy, and a succession mm. of he starts off with some African American soldiers speak mm-hmm. to him, one mm-hmm. of whom David Oyelowo. Mm-hmm. Is one of one of the African American soldiers, and then you get mm-hmm. two white European Union soldiers as well. What I I don't think it starts that well because it seems like the entire Union army has memorized the Gettysburg Address. Yes, I mean heart. to the point where it's it's you know like it's as if it's been it it's been taught in school and they've known f- since they were children how I mean the way the the fluency in which they recite it is. <laughs> is you know I, I understand what you mean it's a little bit it's sort of I, I think that's quite Steven Spielbergian yeah I was know. gonna say I mean I don't necessarily condemn him for this because the Gettysburg Address is so brilliant mm. and so incredible and in yeah. only 270 odd words yeah and I love it also because it has echoes of the Pericles's funeral oration from the Peloponnesian War in the 5th mm. century BC so it, it's it is hugely powerful, and yeah. I think I don't I think in recently in, in, due to you know recent political de- developments in America, it perhaps has had its power slightly diluted, which is a sad thing because yeah, the words it's a are terrible just, shame. But the, the words are just so simple, beautifully powerful that yeah, um, as agree. an American, I'd I'd cheerfully memorize it. But mm. uh, yeah, anyway, I wanted to mention that about the. Address. It's a really important speech. I mean, it, it, I think uh, the opening visually is is interesting because it's the only part of the film of that kind, of that style. Quite brutal. I mean, it's quite brutal. The the, the fighting within the battle that you see in the mud at the beginning, um, to the point where some of it looks so real and them kicking their the these heads below the waterline and you know it's just it's it's and you you think oh my god what kind of a film am i in for here and then suddenly you know after that it's nothing but talking and it's as i think steven spielberg said it's the talkiest film he's ever made and it and he said it's really a film that i took a back seat on and the and the script is really at the forefront of it all um, and the performances but yeah it's it's a it's interesting that you he sort of takes you down a. He slightly leads you down the garden path and then uh, swings in another direction. I just think the design of the film is amazing. The detail in in the period is quite astonishing. He has his his usual costume designer and production designer, I think, who just create such a first hand feel of of the place of everywhere they go the 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 house of representatives i mean i'm pretty sure that was a set and i think it's it's pretty astonishing yeah um, it's it's amazing i mean even the streets which are um mm. muddy and and dark with all the yeah. you know, presumably yeah. yeah yeah it's very good but so w- with the way the story gets going is that mm. this is really lincoln intending to emancipate the slaves mm-hmm. and there's a scene yeah. i wanted to talk about where mm-hmm. He is in with his cabinet and he explains the intricacies of his earlier presidential declaration, I think it was, where he essentially he emancipated the slaves. Yeah. But it was a it was a, you know, as I mentioned, a presidential order. So constitutionally Mm. was problematic. And he explains this brilliantly in in a sort of two or three minute. Um, explanation Mm. and it it really does get to the heart of the civil war i think because the civil war i mean it's interesting you speak to certainly people in the south yeah they would argue that it the civil war was about state states rights some would or that it was also others would describe it as the war of northern aggression my brother-in-law is from alabama and he would ah really Yes, he has described. Is that what he would describe it as? Well, I think he's saying that tongue. He is saying that tongue in cheek. Mm. To be clear. Mm. But it does go to the heart of the problem. I mean, mm. we all know the war was about slavery. So even if it were about states' rights, it was about the states' mm. rights to enslave its. Population. Yeah, well, I found it really interesting that um, you know they that they kept also trying to enforce the the point that they were a different country. 
and that they kept having to be reminded no 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 you're 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 we're all citizens of the same country and you're a rebellion and the fact that no other nation on earth recognized the confederacy as a country in itself but i i find it interesting whether they actually believed that or they were simply trying to make a point i think um, they did i think they did yeah absolutely they were mm. viewing themselves as a separate yeah. country they believe so, that very strongly i yeah. I, I think I, but i think that that goes to the heart of it because mm. the the union viewed them as very much part of well of the united states yeah and so yeah. they viewed them as as, as, as traitors mm. you know i should point out i've got lots of listeners and I know because my map tells me I've got lots of listeners <laughs> in, in America and I'm really hoping they're not all pulling their hair out, screaming at their <laughs> iPhones. At these two uh, Brits. Who but... the hell are these British people that think that they can? Yeah, no, it's true. Or who the hell does this British person think he can play one of our greatest Americans? But the... I didn't want it. So I don't want to linger too long on the mm. whys and the wherefores of the Civil War. Mm. Other than that, the description by Daniel Day-Lewis in that cabinet scene is really powerful where he explains the the, tr mm. the trouble with the Constitution, uh, which obviously was written by the Founding Fathers or more particularly Thomas Jefferson. And slavery was essentially parked until the Civil War resolved it. Here is the scene. We're 30 minutes in and Lincoln is talking to his cabinet. I decided... The Constitution gives me war powers. And no one knows just exactly what those powers are. Some say they don't exist. I don't know. I decided I needed them to exist to uphold my oath to protect the Constitution, which I decided meant that I could take the rebel slaves from them as property confiscated in war. That might recommend a suspicion that I agree with the Rebs that they're slaves of property in the first place. Of course, I don't. Never have. Glad to see any man free, and if calling a man property or war contraband does the trick, why I caught at the opportunity. Now, here's where it gets truly slippery. I use the law allowing for the seizure of property in a war, knowing it applies only to the property of governments and citizens of belligerent nations, but the South ain't a nation. That's why I can't negotiate with them. So if, in fact, the Negroes are property, according to law, have I the right to take the rebels' property from them if I insist they're rebels only and not citizens of a belligerent country? It's slipperier still, I maintain it ain't our actual southern states in rebellion, but only the rebels living in those states. The laws of which states remain in force. The laws of which states remain in force. That means that since it's states' laws that determine whether Negroes can be sold as slaves as property, the federal government doesn't have a say in that, at least not yet. Then Negroes in those states are slaves, hence property, hence my war powers allow me to confiscate them as such, so I confiscate them. But if I'm a respecter of states' laws, how then can I legally free them with my proclamation as I've done? Unless I'm cancelling states' laws. I felt the war demanded it. My oath demanded it. I felt right with myself, and I, I hoped it was legal to do it. I'm hoping still. Two years ago, I proclaimed these people emancipated. Then, thenceforward and forever free. When I say the courts decide I had no authority to do it, they might well decide that. Say there's no amendment abolishing slavery. Says after the war, and I can no longer use my war powers to just ignore the court's decisions like I sometimes felt I had to do. Might those people I freed be ordered back into slavery? That's why I'd like to get the 13th Amendment through the House and on its way to ratification by the states, wrap the whole slavery thing up forever and I as soon as I'm able. Now, end of this month. And I'd like you to stand behind me, like my cabinet's most always done. It, I just thought that scene was really, really... Yes, yeah, so I thought it was, and it was very succinct for a very talky film. <laughs> um, the one thing that you do obviously realise about Lincoln, in this film anyway, is that he really liked to tell stories and, and actually talk quite 
quite a bit. Everything was, you know, slightly humorously done. Danny D. Lewis always does something with a with the smile in the corner of his mouth, uh, or, or tells stories with a smile in the corner of his mouth. Um, in fact, there's, I think maybe you could argue. I mean, one of the characters actually says in the film, "I will not listen to another one of your stories," and it, you know, this is, I think, kind of helps the perception that we have that he was such a lovely family man. I do have one slight criticism of Abraham Lincoln as a as a president. So please excuse me, listeners in America. But like I found a quote that he it was at the at a meeting, it was at the White House and he was addressing the leaders of the Native Americans. And this is something that I feel that you know, it's never kind of mentioned when he's revered as, you know, he, he, he abolished slavery, he, the, the Civil War was won, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I found it a very interesting quote. Uh, I mean, this is sort of slightly parenthetical to what we're talking about, but I have it here and it, and it struck me as quite surprising. Now, I don't know the ins and outs of, of how exactly he was trying to help the Native Americans, if at all. I, I mean, I don't know. But this is a quote, Abraham Lincoln speech to Native American leaders in the White House on March 1863. I'm really not capable of advising you whether in the providence of the great spirit, who is the great father of us all, it is best for you to maintain the habits and customs of your race or to adopt a new mode of life. I can only say that I can see no way in which your race is to become as numerous and as prosperous as the white race, except by living as they do. And I find that quite, I mean, I, I, knew, I know nothing about his, his, his outlook, his perception of the Native Americans, but considering his, his undying effort to get this amendment passed and get rid and win the Civil War and get rid of slavery, it's, I find it really surprising that, that he didn't have, he didn't match that passion uh, the, the situation with the Native Americans at the time. Yes, well, that, certainly the uh, Native Americans, once the Civil War is over and under Ulysses S. Grant, the, well, ultimately the destruction of the Native Americans mm. happens in due course. But it, they, he didn't, it, well, I'm, I may be wrong here, but I think he didn't take the same stance as all men are equal or born equal. I kind of want to say, except for the Native Americans. Well, it's difficult was... because the Native Americans didn't want to be part of the United States. They didn't want to take part in democracy. It sort of marginalised them even more, and, and it kind of... His approach to slavery was, it evolved. I mean, he, I think mm. he was always against it, but he was mm. a pragmatist as well. So he, at the outbreak of war, I think he find him saying, I want to preserve the Union if that means we have slavery, but the Union is preserved, mm. then... You know, I'd rather preserve the Union. But I think his view changed over the course of the war. And and so who's, who's to say that his view on Native, the Native Americans wouldn't have changed as well? And mm. it's always very difficult when you pluck a sentence or two from that might well have been part of a huge long... Exactly, exactly, yeah, exactly. Who's to say? I mean, talking about the film now, obviously we went off on a bit of a tangent. Sorry about that. The there's there's I also have one slight criticism of of I, I think everybody in it by the way I think James Spader steals the film yeah um, he's, well, he's got a great he's, part he's got a great yeah, part. it's a fantastic part it's the character so well defined I do have a slight issue I find the scenes between Lincoln and his wife and and particularly coming from Sally Field who I love by the way I've loved her ever since Smokey and the Bandit um, but. At least she didn't say not without my daughter. No, would upset my wife. I really, <laughs> who's, who who will be mentioned in the next film talking about Iran. Anyway, oh yes, of course, yeah, absolutely. I find Sally Field's performance a little bit theatrical, a, a, a little bit like I am at the theatre watching two actors on stage. It's a, it's I don't want to say forced, but um, well, at one point he, she says, hmm. "You're not going to put me in a mental institution again," which yeah. he did. <laughs> yes 
Yeah, now, now I don't. I, I'm not saying um, that in the context of her behaving performance to suggest that she should mm. have been put in a mental no. institution. I'm not suggesting <laughs> that for a moment, not. dear listeners. <laughs> uh, all I'm saying is that perhaps this is rather a clumsy way mm. of showing um, a bit of mental illness. Perhaps the thing is, is that everybody in the film, I think, gives quite realistic, naturalistic performances. Even the bigger, slightly more fan, but like James Spader, for example, is slightly more flamboyant. But they're all very much rooted in reality. It's there's they they don't concentrate on traits of the period, even though there is obviously some slightly archaic dialogue. But I mean, I think it's, the dialogue is very natural as well. But there's something about Sally Field's performance that just sort of edges on the slightly too. She's dealing with the loss of a child, isn't she? So, I, yeah, I don't. Uh, yes. Part of our film club, I had these categories um, talk about, and I've, one of the categories was most unlikely. Even though we're talking about historical films, so it sounds sounds yeah. like you just you've just mentioned Mrs. Lincoln <laughs> seems very unlikely. So we'll that, let's just emphasize the perf- sl- just ever so slightly the performance. That's what I uh, was referring to. Obviously, not the actual human. The no. real- being. Uh, the other thing I found I was a bit unsure mm. about was the vice president of the Confederacy when he he appears to to negotiate with well with Lincoln and mm. his his Secretary of State Seward. This the vice president of the Confederacy, uh, Jackie have, Earl Haley. He's yeah, great actor. He plays um, Alexander Stevens. St- Alexander Stevens. Yeah. And he's terribly polite to the uh, African American yes. troops. I found that scene a bit. I I wonder if the un if the Union Army, mm. if Grant would have sent a detachment of of African American troops to collect the Confederate. Well, unless they were like you know, unless I mean, there's no was, reason why they shouldn't. But no, uh, but I think you know maybe they were trying to make a point as well. Yeah. And and I mean, there I remember the scene where they they pull up, and I think all the African Americans are on the are on their horses. And the, and the Confederates pull up and basically every single one of the Confederates, except for Stevens, glares. You know, they, they there's an absolutely undisguisable glare, a menacing glare that they give every one of the African-Americans, except for Stevens. You know, I think he says something like much obliged. Yes. Um, to them. Who knows? Yeah, maybe it is a bit unlikely. Another category is best performance. Now it's it's I've mentioned one, but. James Spader. Um, it's got well, to be, it's got to be Day Lewis. Otherwise, why why did everyone on the set have to call him Mr. President the whole time? That would have been for nothing if he didn't then win the Aspects of History Film Club Best. Ah, uh, right. I see. Okay, that's interesting. So, are we going with with his method or what we genuinely think as the best? No, performance what we in genuinely. The film? What we genuinely. I mean, the thing is, it's actually quite a, a hot topic with me because I absolutely love. I think the best pieces of drama whether it be theater whether it be television whether it be film my favorite form is when there's an on ens- it's great ensemble acting i much prefer that to one towering performance that carries a film who's when someone asks who's your favorite performance like the guys who are on the opposition you know who are for, who are pro slavery i well, just we, think we're all got brilliant tommy lee, tommy lee jones yes who plays and tommy lee jones is always great you know, he doesn't. He, ne- he never really does put a foot wrong, and he really is very good in this. I mean, he's hysterically funny in some scenes. Thaddeus Stevens, one of the radicals. Yeah, he's he's fantastic. Uh, I'm wondering who you think is is also very mm. good. Yeah, the House of Representatives scenes when they're debating. See, they're everybody's very good in the it's film. Got Wal- they've got Walton Goggins in uh, there. I love. Oh, who's who's a great actor. So, well, I mean, I probably would go with James Spader, but simply because I love James Spader. <laughs> in pretty much everything he does and i just love this character in this but i understand if we're going to get a lot of stick for not giving it to daniel day lewis I- i'm um, going to go with daniel day lewis because of the voice mm-hmm. and the and the gate okay. and the, the and number the of lines he, was... he had to learn probably <laughs> well that's what actors do though that's not as challenging as hamlet for example james spader i think his best role was in mannequin he plays the slime mannequin and he was very good in an f- indie film called secretary with Maggie Gyllenhaal. That's very good. Uh, Maggie... Oh, and Sex Lies Videotape and a great David Cronenberg film called Crash. 
Yeah. So you go Daniel Day Lewis and I well, okay, so Daniel Day Lewis, fine. Okay, so we've gone <laughs> most inaccurate scene. I think we've gone with the opening scene, have we? With the you, you mean the when they recite the Gettysburg address to him. Yes. Yeah. And the thing is, uh, that, can I just add to that bit? When he's reciting it to him, and I think he takes over from his colleague, and then as he's reciting it, he just turns around and walks away. <laughs> And just walks away from Lincoln. And it's like, well, I get it. It's dr- dramatic. and But I think you'd maybe just stay and say, thank you very much, Mr. President, for talking to me. <laughs> yeah. So I agree with that, by the way. Yeah. Uh, good, good call. Now, the other category I've got on this is mm-hmm. its legacy, the, f- the, the film's legacy. Now, I mm-hmm. think it's rather sank without a trace. I agree. Agree. I think it's it hasn't sunk without a trace as much as what I think is a very underrated Steven Spielberg film, which is and I know you like the documentary about the subject um, Munich. I think that's a film that the more you watch it, if you can just watch it more than once, for the third time and then the fourth, it gets better and better, and you realise, wow, this is a great film. I can actually think I argue the same thing about Minority Report. I think it's another one of his most underrated films. Yeah, I don't I'd... know how this is going to... I mean, this is now... This is 11 years old now, Lincoln. And it to me, it's a bit odd because I feel like it's only like three or four. But it has sort of sunk without a trace, regardless of its accolade. I and mean, the fact that Danny Zero is one, the, the importance of the subject matter is, you know, he's... I don't know. It's odd. No one really mentions it when they go, you know, what what are great Steven Spielberg films? I mean, maybe it's not a great Steven Spielberg film uh, to most people. Well, I thought um, it was really good because I enjoy I enjoy watching the mechanics and, and the parts of, of government. and yes, I agree. But Absolutely. I don't think it makes particularly good cinema. It depends what your definition of cinema is, I suppose. I mean, maybe... Well, enter- entertainment. What I'm saying is I think I'm unusual in that I like watching politicians sort of... Uh... So do I. I mean, I mean, one of the greatest television series ever made is The West Wing. And it's a lot of people talking about politics and, and policies, bills, you know, all sorts of things. And why is it interesting? Lincoln should be boring, if you think about it. It should be terribly dull. But it's not. I think if I were to say anything about it, I would literally just take out the, the husband and wife scenes because they, I think they slow it down. Yeah, we get that he's a family man and that he's a lovely father and we, we get it. But we get that he's a decent person through, the pol- through all the politics scenes. So you would remove the only female presence in the entire... That's really awful thing to say. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> There is the, the, the maid, the maid as well. Would you keep the maid, or would you get rid of her? Uh, I would. I would definitely keep the maid. I would. I would. So the keep... only female presence would be an African American maid. You're happy with your choice there. Um, this is why I think maybe, and I, this is literally a, a point I was about to make when you were talking about not good cinema. I I was thinking maybe it would have if it had stayed in the original in its original form that as in the whole life of Lincoln. well i don't know whether it was the whole life but the 500 page script that was originally written maybe it would have made a very interesting tv series and so we could have you know you could have a hell of a lot more characters uh, well you know there's but- a there, there is something missed out i think that hmm. there are some historians who argue that the the driver behind mm-hmm. changing the constitution and the mm-hmm. addition of the 13th amendment for the abolition of slavery is was actually from a female political group in in the north of America, and so oh wow, that, that, yeah, that well could, that's interesting. Yeah, that I mean could, that I, that I would have found that very interesting indeed. I mean it's a very radical thing to say, but the fact is that you know Sally Field is really the only female character with any substance. But of course that goes to show it's reflecting the period of time the, where they. The hmm. maid is is very powerful. I think she doesn't get, have many scenes, but she is very no. important. Her presence is very powerful because she sits up in the in the uh, gallery in the house, doesn't she? And watches a hell of a lot. Played by Gloria Rubin, of course. And um, it's revealed that she is a former slave who had, yeah. had been beaten. I found it to be quite cinematic, to be honest. I mean, you know, visually everything, It's even though it is a very... I mean, it's written by a playwright. So you can sort of see the the style where he's coming from. Um, but I found it to be 
very cinematic. Why it's, I, I mean, I, I don't know whether it's sunk without a trace, but no one really talk. I don't really talk about it with anyone, or at least no one's talked about it with me. Um, if one thinks of a Civil War film, I would think of Glory. Oh yeah, well that's, yeah, it's iconic. It's not a subject matter that's been, has it been dealt with like I don't know if you've seen Cold Mountain. Oh, the the Anthony Minghella film, yeah. Yeah, which is which is from the Confederate side, mm. and mm. actually there's a hugely powerful opening scene where forget the battle mm -hmm. when a mining operation by the Union side goes wrong and they right. blow up a huge amount of earth. So I remember now. Yeah. But it blocks them off, and and so the Union, the troops who are who are charge in, are then mm. it's a dead end, and they are fired upon, sort of turkey shoot, thousands slaughtered. Isn't it also touched upon in? I think one of uh, we both think this is one of the greatest films ever made: The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. It is, but I don't. But not really in any think... meaningful way. It's just like a plot device, really, isn't it? Yeah, you couldn't call it a civil war film. No. Um... But the thing is, is I mean, this is a civil war film without any war. <laughs> uh, except for the opening scene there is literally no you do not see any battles or uh, i mean you you see ulysses s grant kind of jared harris who, who i love jared harris yeah amazing actor yeah jared harris sounds exactly like his father richard harris he also i don't know if you're aware is has got previous in mm -hmm. playing uh historical characters set in america because he is in The Last of the Mohicans. Yes, he is. Absolutely right. He plays a very um, small part as a junior officer. However, the most surprising small role he did in his early career is in... No one will know it. I don't think anyone will ever know it's Jared Harris. But he's in a brief moment in Oliver Stone's Natural Born Killers, where Mickey and Mallory Knox, the leads, the serial killers, are now extremely famous around the world. And you get news clips from all around the world. And then you see a clip of Jared Harris in London. And he basically says to camera as a cockney, yeah, you got Dylan, you got, you got JFK and you got Mickey and Mallory Knox. And that's Jared Harris as a very young guy, very young actor. <laughs> I thought I had got you over the last one, <laughs> Mohicans, but Trump. Uh, he's very good. He's actually yeah. also very good. Just whilst I just want to mention Jared Harris again, I'm a big fan of his. Mm. He's very good in the new the 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 Terror, which is a the first series of the Terror, which he plays a ship's captain on the the search for the Northwest Passage. It's got Kieran Hines as well. Oh yes, I've seen it. Yes, of course. It's and they get show. stuck in the ice. They do. Anyway, so yeah. uh, so legacy. Then I yeah, I don't think it's got much of a legacy. This film, I really don't. No, it's a shame because I, I my favourite bits of the film are when they're debating or scenes with Tommy Lee Jones berating someone when they walk, come into his office. But I mean, of course, we know the outcome. But the journey is interesting. I do think it's an interesting. It's an interesting, in, as you say, in the in and outs of politics and how things are done and blah blah. blah. I mean, people may disagree with us, of course, and may say, you know, may say that no, what are you talking about? This is a monumental landmark film. But I agree, it is. But I just don't think many other people mm. think that. But I mean, popular, you mean? It may be because of the format. You said, is it particularly cinematic for most people? I don't but, know. As you say, it works for the West Wing. Although I watched the West Wing mm. again, and I don't think it stands up to too many other viewings. Everything goes right for them. They're always right. And when they've mm. got a difficult Republican opponent, mm. Mm. he's basically a Democrat. <laughs> Alan Alder. Yeah, it's true. Yes, exactly. Who, who I think at the end becomes an advisor. Exactly. To the new Democratic president. Can you imagine very... Trump going, oh, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to down my weapons. I'm going to yeah. help Joe Biden now. Let's think of the way we can resolve the problems that the country has. No, but I, I like dipping in and out of the West Wing. I do find it comforting. I find it like a little bit like revisiting friends it becomes bigger. It becomes a little bit more. Uh, it becomes a little bit more schmaltzy, if I could say that. Yeah. So I don't know. Lincoln. Good film. Very good. Interesting character. Yeah, well, I hope this inspires those of you who haven't seen it and who are listening. I do recommend watching it. It is mm. it is a really really powerful film, but it's sad that it's it's. Um, it, I don't think it has had the impact that perhaps Spielberg intended. Well, Tim, thank you. We are going to talk about Argo for our next club, um, but we'll sign off on those three categories. So the most inaccurate scene was the 
recitation of the Gettysburg Address by the entire Union Army. Best performance, Daniel Day-Lewis. And legacy, eh, not so much. Thanks, Tim. No problem. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for listening. It's great and humbling to have so many new listeners join. And I really do hope you enjoyed our first film club. Links are in the show notes if you'd like to get in touch. I'd be very keen to hear your views. Next in the club is Argo, directed by Ben Affleck. And with the recent developments in Iran, it's something both Tim and I were very keen to discuss. As I mentioned at the start, there's plenty of great history coming up. But until then, thank you and good night.